Checking on chat right now. It's mm -hmm. disabled for the chat. Is it to YouTube. Trying to think of another way we could do this.
Testing one, two, three. Today is Saturday, November 26th. The year is 2021. important 
hopefully it will help uh, set some parameters around what we can expect for this experience. Um, but also hopefully we'll be a place where you can feel compelled to ask questions. Um, and we'll present all of this again on our website um, so that you can watch it um, in a more time shifted way. So we're, we're sort of recording this now, but also for the future. So Mark uh, and David, I, I would love for you all to maybe like talk about some of your respective uh, areas of, of interest. Um, I think that before we do that, I, I want to kind of set up how we got here. So at the heart of Science Gallery's approach to presenting ideas, there is this intersection of art and science and leveraging world-class art, if you will, to connect to world-class research. And the ideas that are in those spaces are the things that we really want to pull out and, and push out into the world for further consideration. And so for the last several months, we've all been in conversation, you all have been in conversation. I really enjoy those conversations, but I think it, it really highlights what I think are, are your, your areas of interest and, and passion for, I think for our you, Mark, this sort of artistic view of how we're looking at ourselves, both in the real world, um, in this digital space. Um, for you as an, as, a, as an artist, you're thinking about representation in a variety of ways. But also because you're, you're, you're teaching students at, at Tech, I think there's this you know, multi-layered approach where, you, where I, I just feel like your, your perspective on this is very valuable. And for you, David, I think thinking about social media, um, our digital lives as a business concern or from a, a, a data perspective, and how that data connects to some of the aesthetic how that data um, is leveraged by brands, individuals, and really creates a bit of a, uh, a context for both the art and the science, how we live currently. So I've talked a lot to set us up, but I really want to, to kind of give some space to, to you all now and to talk about this idea. So um, because we are active as well business school at Emory University, I'll give you, David, the honor of, of speaking first. This is your sort of home turf, if you will. <laughs> and thank you for your time today. All right, thanks a lot, Floyd. And thank you those of you who are joining us. Um, I got into doing research related to social media um, before it was really called social media. At the time, we called it user-generated content and we were primarily focused on online product reviews and what could we learn from those online product reviews? How could we establish relationships between those online reviews and future purchasing behavior? And from a business standpoint, did that online space matter? And it, now it's been more than a decade that I've been uh, working in the, uh, on related research, and what we can say, definitely um, it's a space that matters, that a space that businesses need to be paying attention to. Uh, and I was a little bit su surprised, um, although in hindsight probably shouldn't have, um, have been in terms of how that space has evolved. And so if we think about how marketing has historically been done, it's been the agency or the brand that says, this is the message and I'm gonna push it out to you. And what social media had done is empower consumers to own that conversation if they wanted to. So it wasn't just saying, I'm the brand and I'm gonna tell you what you think of my product. Now we're seeing that consumers are taking ownership and in some cases dictating the conversation. And so I think you know, what I found this, um, to be interesting is that shift in the power and you know, what that ends up meaning in terms of how do brands, how do marketers need to think about engaging with consumers uh, differently. You know, if we fast forward to where we are you know, today we've seen stories uh, about, and we've seen laws passed in European countries about the adverse consequences of um, photoshopping having on self perceptions. And we've got some research um, that we're conducting um, that probes that. We've seen the Facebook papers come out and the implications that it's had for learning about what do companies know and how do these online platforms really affect our realities. 
And um, before we started today, you know, we were talking about you know, um, the idea of the Facebook metaverse being in the news these days. Um, it really challenges us in terms of what is the true reality.
But like that was like the beginning of these conversations. And as we sort of evolve into this digital space where we have an influencer culture, you're now tying up with the brand side. So you mentioned product reviews, which if you think about all of the you know unboxing videos that we have now or the ads or again influencers who are sort of presented and positioned to, you know, be a pitch for a certain product and to give you all this amazing, you know, info about the attributes and everything else. I feel like we're sort of seeing this convergence of both like the, you know, the reviews sort of, you know, being blurred between the ads. Like ads and product reviews kind of are like, you know, blurred lines there with the actual evolution of this photo manipulation from the Photoshop days up to the build and everything else. So like now we're sort of seeing this convergence of where um, both the, the brand concerns Art is, is also present. Individuals are sort of in that mix as well. And then there's data, which is sort of reinforcing how we're exposing that to the audience because all of this is being tracked. And as an audience, we are, we're being fed, we're being exposed to all of this in a variety of ways with all these sort of competing um, convergences and all these competing interests. So if you're, on your Instagram feed, for example, and you're scrolling through, you know, there's data reinforcing what you're, what, what you're, you're being seen, there's messaging, there's the images, there's all these things that are coming together. So I think like this is sort of the, the foundation for why we're thinking about unfiltered as, as a particular artistic and scientific and research-based project for South Carolina and Atlanta. And so, to just fast forward a bit for those who are are watching this, um, when Hooked Atlanta opens in 2022, um, there will be an artistic presentation uh, of this experience. So this conversation, all of our conversations are, are, are leading to something that will exist in the gallery space um, that captures all of this, but this is really sort of the behind the scenes of how we even got there, why this is of, of, of importance to us, um, you know, why it's important to me as a, as a, as a co-curator and kind of as well. So that's the background. Um, let's maybe dive deeper into what the actual challenge is. So this particular slide shows a campaign uh, that was presented by uh, uh, Doug. Um, David, you sort of gave us this bit of an example let me talk through this example, or really what this example is signifying or trying to convey. And so, you know, some of you may remember this, but years ago, Dove had launched kind of the Real Beauty campaign. And my recollection is the Real Beauty campaign was kind of trying to get us to kind of recognize the media portrayal of beauty versus reality. You know, that it wasn't the same thing, and that we shouldn't be kind of idealizing that media portrayal. And they had a fair amount of success, um, I believe, with that campaign. Well, fast forward to today, kind of selfie culture, and this is kind of an updated take on that real beauty campaign. Um, the image, of, um, you, know, you kind of see the more natural looking image, which is the actual person, and you see kind of the final, fully airbrushed Photoshop version of the person. And what Dove had done in this video was to kind of say, let's start with kind of that Photoshop uh, Instagram ready image and let's play in reverse everything that went into creating that image. And by the time you get back to, um, or by the time you finish the video and you're back to the original person, you kind of start to realize, wow, what we see on social media, there's fairly little resemblance to what a person actually looks like. Um, and it kind of struck me, I teach a class on social media and I teach classes related to um, data, technology, marketing, and kind of societal and ethical issues um, related. And there was a story that, was, that ran in the Washington Post, this was three or four years ago, I think, that um, the story had run. And it was um, kind of from the viewpoint of a teenager who was celebrating her birthday with her family. And the, like, kind of the commentary on it 
was how she put all of this weight into on whether or not her Instagram photos got likes from her friends. Uh, and that was almost, it, it almost seemed like that's how she evaluated self-worth, was do the photos that I share get liked by, by my peers? Um, and, and that kind of struck me, um, and kind of the way that I ended up getting um, into some of this research recently was I have a, a colleague, uh, Morgan Ward, and she and I were talking because we both have um, elementary school uh, age daughters at home around, you know, kind of what's technology, you know, what is technology doing and what's kind of the world going to look like when they're teenagers or older because um, what we've seen is that it disproportionately affects young girls. So, in thinking about this campaign, and thinking about a lot of our own individual experiences with social media, I think there is there is this inclination to want to be popular. Or if I post something that, if, if, you know, if I'm sharing, I do want there to be a positive, a, a wildly regarded positive response to it, right? Um, and so, and there's the feedback loop of if I posted something, I got a positive response, I'll post more. And then there becomes, you know, you're being informed by um, the public, or at least your personal public in this. Um, but I am curious, and I, I want to maybe think about this from not just an artistic, but maybe even a personal standpoint, thinking beyond just the concept of, of social media, but the concept of whatever our best selves are. Because I am curious about this notion of for for years, whether it be actors on stage and on screen or individuals, you know, the, the there is always makeup, you know, for for those of us. Um, I mean, the makeup the makeup uh, industry is always you know really pretty robust industry um, over time, and so I guess it's like where is that great area, I guess, between personal agency to want to look how you want to look, right? If, if that involves makeup, if that involves wanting to um, manipulate digitally, whatever, how you may, you know, look in the world, how to say, the surgery, you know, it's like, like I want to have this conversation about this filtering versus, you know, imperfection versus being unfiltered, but also like, how do we just sort of make it a little bit messy? Like it make make like a little bit more nuanced around, well, what's the personal agency in that to be able to say I would like how I look with makeup on? And this how I want to be in the world. Or I like this version of myself because I am aspiring to be this particular, you know, to be this particular person in the world. So I guess I want to like leave some space to, to include that in in this. Um, you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> My mind keeps trying to paint. Painting, um, what yeah. painting? <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, take it back to, uh, you know, uh, uh, any number of periods in the story of uh, some interpretive material on what the sign of the for example, around Rubens, and talking about how they like it to be the Spielberg of his age. Now Spielberg's name doesn't sound like this. Thing as it used to, but um, you know that the Duke in question in this portrait was uh, more beholden to Rubens because he was an instrumenter, right? He could, he could create the legend, he could establish the brand, um, and reinforce the uh, influence of people that he painted, right? And within the images, the <coughs> symbols of Education, so both the ownership of property and you know, uh, position within the church, uh, <clears throat> any number of things that it gives us a little bit of, of perspective on what's going on now. In addition, uh, you know, being able to lean a little heavily on how their appearance was, you know, historicized in this age. So it's, it's interesting for me, of course, to reference that as we. And I would imagine, Mark, in the history of painting, you know, when people get their portraits made, if you 
you know, if I'm sitting for my portrait, you know, I may want to make me look a little bit <laughs> taller, a little, you know, or right. like, you know, make me look right. a, little, a little bit thinner, a little bit taller, make me look the most idealized version of myself, sure. right? Mm -hmm. um, and if we're talking about um, royalty, for example, you know, you're, you're sort of trying to create the most flattering portrait of of that monarch. And if you didn't, maybe you didn't have a job after that. You know, like you may be, you may be, you know, we're not, mm -hmm. you know, they, they may have some, some, some consequences you know, if, if you did not give them that burden of themselves. So I think we, I think it's always been this notion of like, of like vanity, you know, when it comes to us as, as humans. Um, so I just want to make sure that was part of this conversation because I think that there is some level of, of wanting to acknowledge that part of it. But I also just think that maybe with, with a campaign like this, David, is that the difference maybe comes when there are um, unhealthy standards. Right, and I think that's where it, 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 social media kind of poured fuel on fire yeah. uh, in a lot of ways, right? Like, you know, people have always used makeup. Professionals have always done photoshopping, right? Like, we know those things exist, but the scale at which they're used today is unparalleled. And I think you know, the technology contributes to that. And Floyd, you kind of alluded to this earlier of, you know, I post a picture that I Photoshop. If I see that it gets more engagement, it gets shared more, it gets more likes, all right, well, if I'm thinking, well, I like that, that positive feedback. Um, there's been reports about how these social media platforms are engineered to give you that ping each time that you get a like. It gives you that little, um, positive hit. And so what am I going to post? I'm going to post more stuff that is like that. Now that, so you have that choice of what you continue to post. But on the other side of it is the person who liked that image. Right now, that algorithm that kind of feeds, the, that drives their social media feed is learning what is it that you like and the stuff that you like, I'm going to show you more of. And so what ends up happening is in many respects, you kind of keep on going down that path, and eventually what you're being shown is what's going to create your sense of what is normal. Like, you know, we talk about that, you know, things like online echo chambers, right? Where it's I'm only being I'm only being exposed to information that reinforces my existing views. Um, and so that's that's um, where, where I think the, the potential danger of social media comes into play in terms of the amount of exposure that we have to it, that is what has the potential to set what we consider to be the norm. You mentioned the algorithm, and I think that's something that both influencers or content creators have talked about, as well as audience, the rest of us, have, have talked about as well in terms of how these platforms are designed. And so to your point, if you like a couple of images, um, if you, you know, whether it be people or places, you know, travel photos, nature, whatever the case may be, um, the algorithm is, is learning you. It's learning you, it's learning how to frame up your world. So there is a possibility that over time, your perception of what the world is, or your online world, may consist of, of a very small percentage of the accounts that you're actually following, but you're being shown this over and over again, and maybe not getting the, the, you know, the full picture of, or the, sort of the full scope of all the accounts that you may interact with, or you may want to interact with. And so there's a design component to that, um, both in the algorithm as well as the scrolling of that. So, you know, there's, uh, infinite scroll capacity, so there's always more to show you. And I think that when we talk about hooked and addiction and unpacking that, I think this is really what we want to get to in terms of like how are we designing systems and platforms that are contributing to, um, you know, this sort of addictive space or this alternate reality that may or may not be reflective of the world that we actually live in. Um, so I think like that is that is very important, it's like the actual algorithm and how we're we're designing for that um, for that space. And so taking 
that consideration taken sort of the the intention behind wanting to put the best self forward, if you will. Um, we are in this space where um, we have moments where if the algorithm ever changes, this often sounds like a big like you know shift in how people are responding to it because if the algorithm shifts and what its favorable responses shifts, that has the tendency to like shift someone's self-esteem, what they think is popular, what they think about themselves is is attractive. There's there's a lot of consequences to that. Um, and so continuing this notion of thinking about this as a challenge, um, there are there are apps, you know, that have that have sprung up that are sort of fostering this ability to create this version of yourself that is most attractive to the public. So we have uh, apps like uh, uh, Facetune, uh, which which are in that space, and there are others also. Um, but David, if you could maybe talk to us about what an app like Facetune actually does. So you know, what these apps are doing, I mean, think of these very similar to kind of like the filters that we apply uh, to our photos, right? Is there they're enhancing the photos in some way. So it might be, okay, you know, I want my eyes to be a little bit bigger, or let me kind of clear up some blemishes that I might have on my skin. I want to airbrush them out so they don't show up. Um, you know, those are relatively minor things, but, and I'm sure many of us have seen these photos of kind of the Photoshop fails that have gone too far, right? And so what these apps are doing are making those kind of professional, what were at one time, the professional tools generally available to the public. Yeah, I, had a, I just remember <coughs> one of my first jobs out of that school was uh, basically doing hair brushes. <laughs> I, I, I could figure out about that. But Mark, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, uh, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, models walking around who, who were already cute and in my opinion that you know where the art where the art of the creative director was asking the airbrusher to increasingly thin them out and you know in my mind I'm just thinking this is wrong in every capacity. Um, but that was something that was twenty years ago. Um, and yeah, at that time I thought, oh, that's you were late on the that game, you know, the you were doing a visual version of what people used to do in other ways. Um, and that this this thing never even occurred to me, right? That that this could be done uh in, in, in such a democratizing way in a sense, right? So on, on one hand you know, you say you kind of you wanted to complicate this that as more nuanced, but you know, you could say, well, it's Maybe this would prevent them from getting plastic surgery, right? Like if, if they're, if they're uh, as a, let's say, an influencer, maybe uh, as a job or a part time role or whatever, maybe it's, it's more healthy, right? They're not, maybe there's no self harm, or whatever you want to consider that. Um, so it's you know, good to look at it from that angle. You mentioned kind of, you know, that you were doing it like digitally, yeah. but that there were kind of pre-digital right. techniques. Yeah, like, like actual airbrush. Oh, okay. right. So, um, you know, that term is because of actually the play. I mean, you go back in photography, you know, we were hand painting black and white photos before, you know, chemistry came out of my life for color. Um, when you think about like the movie with um, Trotsky, he was you know, taken out of the historic play of the time, for example. Um, you know, the language that we use is often for the and what can be for it. So, you know, I, I would probably still use the term of that to describe the process of putting that out of the case to And whatever comes later, the case to me is going to be the term of you had mentioned kind of the, you know, the influencers kind of yeah. using something like this. 
influencers create kind of a really interesting dynamic because if, you know, if we kind of unpack what, if we start with the social media platform, social media platforms are advertising platforms, right? Their goal is get you to click on ads. The way they do that is by keeping you on the site. Right, so I want to show you the content that you like so you spend more time on the site so that I can show you more ads that you're ultimately interested in. When you click on them, I make money. Influencers have become kind of really popular as a marketing tactic because they're more relatable than spokespeople. They're more relatable for the everyday consumer than a celebrity. And it turns out we trust them more than other types of marketing. Uh, and so that's why influencers have become their own economy, but influencers have their own motivations. Right? So the motivation of the influencer is, I want to be paid as much as I can by brands. Right? So there's a, from a financial standpoint, how do I make myself more appealing? Well, I, I'm, more, I'm more appealing to brands if I have more followers. All right, what do I need to do in order to get more followers? Um, and so you know, we've done a little bit of work looking at kind of the micro influencers with the smaller following versus macro influencers. And what we've seen is micro influencers are the ones that benefit more from image manipulation. Right? So if you've got the one to 10,000 followers, let's say, your photoshopped images will be engaged with more than your non-photoshopped images. Whereas if you're Kim Kardashian, Kendall Jenner, Chrissy Teigen, whether you Photoshop it or not doesn't really matter. Um, and so, you know, influencers are going to use Photoshopping if it works for them, if it helps them achieve the goals that they have. The place where it gets a little dangerous, though, is consumers try to compare themselves to those micro influencers, right? Because they're more relatable. There's this idea that I should be like that person, or I am like this person. And so when they post that, idealized image. Like, oh, well, I'm supposed to be able to relate to this person, but their life looks so much better than mine. I end up feeling worse about myself. So that brings in the mental health aspect to it. That brings in, uh, of course, the algorithm, that brings in all the technology. Um, and I know, Mark, in one of our earlier conversations, you, you kind of frame this as like influencer as tragic figure mm -hmm. in a way where tragic in the way in which influencers oftentimes can become trapped in this particular space because of of both the economic value that, that they are deriving from that space but also their understanding that maybe whatever they're presenting to the world is not their truest but like you're trapped there because of the monetization of that space. Say more about that tragic figure um, um, perspective that you, you talked about in early conversations. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I suppose, you know, I think maybe part of you know, like my personality, but the role that I play, you know, like, you know, being an artist or educating, um, you know, I find artistic modes to be a distancing mechanism, right? So <clears throat> I'm interested in, uh, I can sort of play a game, kind of a thought experiment, trying to project myself into the future to look back on what we're doing now. And um, the art is a great way to do that, right? So I, I just found it to be a useful way to think about you know, a fictional character that could help um, they crystallize a lot of different anecdotes and research and whatever to one uh, kind of fictional character looking back on itself, right? So uh, as, as I guess the artist involved in the project, but who's also interested in research and mechanics, um, it just helps me to make sense of what we're talking about. Um, you know, so I think I mentioned the idea of possibly a uh, journal or a diary Sort of, you know, maybe highlighted certain things that you're saying, you know, something to dramatize the uh, the outcomes of being trapped in something. Right? Is that is that mean that you know, prevented that person from having a better self? 
over these terms curated to be uh, most consistent with the eyes of in a particular uh, part of the square, most often the ears and so on and so forth, so that uh, that consistency could help train the, the neural network framework. Um, so, you know, the results have been, um, there, there are a lot of GANs, a uh, second bullet point there, that are uh, kept in a different way. So, there's a website that maybe some of you have seen that is called, uh, this person does not exist. Um, and in terms of what we were doing on the artistic side, uh, you know, I noted that they were very realistic. They looked like your uncle or your brother or your neighbor. And as we started to look at it, we could see little imperfections, like this telltale signs around the ear, for example, around the jaw. You know, so um, to put it to today's terms, in terms of like a, a kind of bogus social media accounts that are trolling uh, campaigns or whatever, you know, they're using these fake images to create these personas to attack other candidates and so on. So they're very effective on um, kind of photo reels and that. Um, and then other data sets produce things that are a little bit more artistic, more expressive, things that are generative in the sense of creating Images that we haven't seen before. You know, just sometimes monstrous like, sometimes grotesque, baby parts, meets man parts, you know, like just things that are we're not used to seeing together, right? Um, or mixed sort of um, facial expressions that physically cannot exist together, right? So it's, it's really interesting to see. I, I liken it to a mirror, very complicated mirror. And so we, we shine light at the uh, data set. And through probabilities and statistics, the neural network reflects that what it's like. And I find that to be a really useful way of thinking about it. Possibly. And of course, the mirror and vanity and you know, the conversation that we're having is a really easy metaphor to communicate. The challenges are, the mechanics are, and so forth. Right? So, and the emotional state, right? Everything, it's a, it's a really convenient metaphor, I find, to think about what's happening in the process. It's interesting because I don't think I really realized how many people were, A, interested in all these different spaces and why this would be of interest to you to study. But then, two, you mentioned the first data set uh, those medical faces that were stricken the internet, which also was kind of scary because you're wondering in the many of the fine print of the services that we use, what rights are we giving up? And what's publicly available? And what do we lose control over when it comes to some of the things like I post on Instagram, who all of a sudden has the right to sort of scrape Instagram or, or, or Twitter or Flipper or anything else to say, oh, we're going to just sort of scan this database, pull the images out. This this feels very complicated in terms of again rights and yeah, ownership. I mean, there's a lot that's going on in yeah. this space. And, I mean, it came to a head. I think it was it was pre-COVID, so I think it was maybe two years ago. There's a company, or there is a company called Clearview AI that made the use. And what they had done is they built a facial recognition database that was being used by law enforcement that was better than any other database that existed available to law enforcement. And like they had proof of concept of saying, we are X times more effective in terms of identifying you know, video or image from a crime and being able to identify that person. Well, how did they get to be that effective? They scraped social media sites. So they scraped images from Facebook, from Instagram, from all over the web that we had never given our permission to a third party company to collect our images, but they did it anyway. Now, all the social media companies quickly sent cease and desist letters to Clearview AI because they said, oh, you collected this in violations of terms of service. 
So even though we as consumers, unknown, you know, maybe we didn't read the terms of service for Facebook when we posted our images, but what those terms of services generally do is say, Facebook gets to use this, right? It doesn't, and maybe Facebook's business partners can, um, can have some access to it. It doesn't say anyone in the world who can, who scrapes Facebook has access to it. And I think, yeah, that's one of the things that we've got to be mindful of is, you know, you put it online, you can't erase the web. So when it comes to this particular hackathon, um, we have to be able to have data sets that we can use to compare um, the, the filtered or the, the perfect images and then being able to reverse that. So it's in some ways, to your point, Mark, about being able to manipulate, uh, collect and manipulate images to foster new images for the purposes of um, different images, we just say. Um, for this particular project, we're thinking about the opposite of that. We're reversing that to see if, um, if and how someone could generate a, an algorithm that could reverse that process um, in an effective way. And so, that sort of, sort of sums up, I think, what, what, what's the you know, perspective that we sort of landed on through all this collaboration. Um, I think we sort of took on some of these like, things that we uh, mentioned uh, before, and, and, and I really want to maybe sort of link into any other ideas about this. Um, I think that the algorithm is the thing that we really want to focus on, for sure, but also I think that we're open to what other ideas may come out of this exercise. Um, because I think that in doing this, there are plenty of other um, creative considerations that may uh, lead to some different ideas. We talked about the ethical concerns. I think there's lots of different ways in which anyone may receive this and again sort of, you know, turn it around and think about what could be produced. So we want to really leave some space for that, you know, as well while we're thinking about purely the, the quantitative side of it. So, and thinking about, uh, uh, had this, here. this is an example of a, of a data set, it's one of the data sets that was used by uh, David. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk to that for a little bit? Yeah, so, I mean, if we think about the challenge that, that, that they presented, I'm saying, can we revert from kind of the Photoshopped image back to its original? You know, what, what, what do we need to, to be able to do? Well, one way of doing that is to say, okay, you know, can, let's detect the differences that exist between the original and the Photoshopped image. And so this was one of the examples of a data set that I have come across that's been used in research, uh, where we have both a digitally manipulated as well as original uh, version of the same image. And so you, you would be able to see, okay, where are, where are the differences? And we will supply links to data sets on our events page. So if you, after you watch this, and if you're watching this on our Times Better Atlanta website, we have links to data sets. And this may even be a bit of an iterative process as we uh, become more familiar with different data sets. We'll include those so that, again, there are more options for how people may want to um, engage in this process. So I just wanted to have this as an, as an example of some of the data sets that we will, we will be um, referencing for this hackathon. Yeah, as I mentioned, there are some pre de previously designed data sets that have been used for research, and the researchers have made those available. Um, another way of doing this would be to create your own data set. Of, you know, if I have my own set of images or I download images, I can apply Photoshop or Facetune to those images, and that'll give you, or again, the original and the Photoshopped image to be able to say, all right, where are the differences, and work toward designing an algorithm that reverts the Photoshop back to the original. So, in speaking about the, uh, the deliverables for this hackathon experience, uh, there are a few things that we're asking for. Uh, so, for one, of course, we talked about uh, how we detected the nature of the manipulation, um, your algorithm, and documentation in the form of a video. This does not need to be 
an overly produced video, but we would love to have a video of you explaining what you did, how you got there, and this is something that I think just helps us sort of document and understand the thinking behind what you've created. And you, meaning you or your team, the multiple, you know, however many folks are going to be together on this, but we just wanted to have something where we can follow your logic and what you developed and how it applies to solving the question slash problem. All good? All right. Um, so in doing so, in presenting this challenge, there's also prizes. Um, we really wanted to make this something that was on brand, I think, and an exhibition type of experience. We're about wanting to provide attribution, provide credit. For the Hook exhibition um, that will open up early next year, um, Mark and David, this is all leading to a collaboration of, of artwork that will be part of the gallery experience. And so for the first prize for this hackathon experience, we're offering $750 uh, cash, but also you'll be included as co-curators, I'm sorry, co-creators. Co -cre co -co we'll be listed along with Mark and David in the credits of, of this work that they're creating for this particular exhibition, as well as mentioned on our website in terms of social media mentions and just the you know, participant in this particular experience. Uh, the second place will be $500 um, and dimensions uh, when it comes to our website and social media. And then we have some space for honorable mentions um, that we'll list alongside of the other winners as well. So this is how we're approaching collaborative art making in a way. I think this represents perhaps the most creative and collaborative artwork that we'll have in the Hook Exhibition season because we don't really know what it will look like at this point. Um, if you're thinking about an exhibition space, thinking about a gallery space and work that you're either you know creating or or getting a loan from, from artists, you kind of know what you're putting into the space, but this is probably the most experimental version of that. And I think for us, this is creating a moment of both um, live science and live art in a way that is creative and collaborative and we're hoping to manifest something that's really interesting uh, for the gallery space, but we still know what it is yet. So that's part of the fun. So more information, uh, we're recording this on Saturday, November 6th. This will go live on our website on Monday, November the 8th at 12 p.m. Uh, we'll be asking for submissions via submittable. There will be links to that on our website. All of this will be on the website, uh, not worried. Uh, but then we'll have roughly a month to get the word out, um, receive submissions, and the submissions will close on Monday, December 6th at 11.59 p.m. So we have about a month to think this over, uh, get creative, pull your friends along if, if you want to have this be a, a team effort. Um, and we'll have this video that you're watching now, we'll have more information about data sets, more information about the, the text for this particular project on our website at atlanta.sciencegallery.com. Um, slash events. Um, as we sort of think about the deliverables, David and Mark, anything come to mind for, for you all in terms of what you want to be thinking about as they are um, endeavoring in this particular experience? Not to put you on the spot, but I just wanted to, you know, we, I mean, we, we talk a lot about this. I just wanted to make sure that we're sort of giving the audience as much as possible to think about for, you know, their uh, submission. I, mean, I think we've got the record. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's all, what we're asking you to do is essentially almost um, come up with like the mirror image, if you will, of phase two. Right? Of, you know, we're accustomed to say, okay, here's the effort that I'm going to put in to go from original to ide what I consider ideal, and now rewind that process. Mm -hmm. Any, any thoughts right now? 
uh, how you, you know, how you did your own testing, um, as much detail as you care to provide. Um, as Floyd had mentioned, we're not looking for something that's necessarily like you know perfect production quality. Um, so if you, you know, record it on your iPhone, record it on a webcam, uh, that's more than more than enough. But you know, it's to help us understand kind of how you approach the problem.
I think Mark and I need to fully flesh out. I mean, definitely one part of it is going to be predictive like performance. Um, yeah, I think that's the most objective component of the criteria that I can think of. Um, yes, I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can have that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, without, without confusing things, I'll, I, 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 I tend to like to leave things really open, and I think I can do it. <laughs> so I will, I will uh, again say that uh, uh, I think you know, any sort of clarifying things that we can provide in the you know, report is will, will do. Uh, you know, of course. I mean, and I would also just encourage, this is me speaking, I'm, I'm not either of them, this is just Floyd <laughs> as a poker writer. Um, but you know, the word, the face <laughs> I, I, I think it, it is also wrong for, I mean, as my old math professor would say, like an elegant solution. Like, I think that there is also a room for making sure that it, it does what it's supposed to do. But if it looks good while doing it, that doesn't hurt either. Um, so just thinking about, again, elegant code and solutions and ways in which you can, you know, add some other, you know, je ne sais quoi if you will, um, to, to whatever it is that you may present in this particular experience. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. You know, the, you know, just to add to the elegance aspect, um, you know, easy to use, you know, easy to use, easy to implement, you know, all the better. It's something that will work in time. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions, comments, ideas from the gallery? Yes, I have. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be shaking. Thank you for asking that question. Um, the Science Gallery Atlanta is open to participation of students in a variety of, of, of ways. This is, I think, the most active way to be involved as an, um, as an artist in conjunction with, with these collaborators. And so I think it was important for us to want to create some level of engagement um, in live science as well as live collaboration. So this is one example of doing that. Um, but I would say that our, our core experience for students um, frame that in the 15 to 25 age group um, is our student mediator experience. Um, student mediators are, I think, so crucial to how Science Gallery um, as a principal, but also Science Gallery Atlanta will, will operate in terms of fostering moments where students are um, our position to help foster engagement with the work between the artists, the researchers, and the public. They are sort of positioned as, as a conduit for that. Uh, Shana Khan is our lead student mediator, so Shana um, could speak more to that. Um, but I think that the student experience is very critical to how we want to um, connect folks to Science Gallery Atlanta. And so that is the the most accessible way that students can be involved. This is a very specific way, um, and we, we, we want to encourage that as well, but I would think the most obvious way and the most direct way which would be as a student leader um, for um, our, our gallery experiences and other events and programming that will be featuring as a part of our book exhibition season. Thank you. Thank you.
programs and our um, exhibition that will be in the spring uh, that we can just step by and be involved. And we would have a lot of interesting conversations happening around addiction. Um, so it's going to be addiction with this one, substance use, um, food addictions, uh, various things. Um, so there's a lot of interesting conversations going on, but if you're interested in being a part of them,